Well, it is good to be back with you. Thank you for giving me this invitation again, Pastor Alex, wherever you are. I hope you're enjoying your time away. And I appreciate the opportunity to come and share this morning. In this uh, current series, Burdened to Build, Pastor asked if I would tackle the third chapter of Nehemiah. So that's what I'm going to do this morning. Maybe he and Jordan will further uh, look at this passage, uh, but I'm going to take all of these verses and try to wrap them up into just a couple of phrases that uh, you can use, hopefully. Uh, you have a ministry folder, and inside your, your ministry folder you have a, uh, a note sheet you can follow along if you choose to do so. Fill in a few blanks if that will help you. Write some, maybe some notes in the margins if that would also be helpful to you. You know, as I read through the book of Nehemiah, and I read through this book numerous times, um, you'll discover there are a number of practical leadership principles that, um, that Nehemiah uses that um, help him to do an effective job of doing what the Lord had called him to do, to, you know, to, leave, to leave King Artaxerxes and to travel to Jerusalem and begin the process of restoring the city. In fact, as you read through the book, you'll find a number of these principles, uh, things like uh, he established a reasonable and attainable goal. He, he was willing to get involved. He prayed at crucial times. He, he made his request with tact and grace and graciousness. And, and the list just goes on and on and on. He, he courageously used the authority of, of his position to do what needed to be done. All kinds of, of uh, principles that literally come out, not, not just in chapter 3, but throughout the various chapters that make up the book of Nehemiah. I, a, a British humorist, and I emphasize the word humorist, named uh, Jerome K. Jerome, said this. He said, I like work. It fascinates me. I can sit and look at it for hours. <laughs> now, if you've read through the book of Nehemiah, if you've read chapter 3, you know that that attitude would never have been embraced by Nehemiah. Uh, Warren Wiersbe uh, further refutes this quote when he writes this. This is important. He says, and I quote, When it comes to the work of the Lord, there is no place for spectators or self-appointed advisors and critics, but there is always room for workers. End of quote. This is one chapter of the Bible that I think very eloquently speaks to how Governor Nehemiah motivated the people and how the people rallied, you know, to get a very, very important job done. And just like, like Nehemiah walked alongside those listed in Nehemiah 4, you know, I would love to walk alongside Pastor Alex and Matt and Jordan, your leadership team, and rally the troops here at Crossroads so you can more systematically accomplish what you say you are to be about. Yeah, this is what I read, your mission statement says, Crossroads Missionary Church seeks to assure that every man, woman, and child within our circle of influence hears and has the opportunity to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ and has the opportunity to grow in the Christian faith as his disciple. Now, I really believe that if you thoroughly, if you really pursue that, you're very sincere about that, then you will, you know, you will make Jesus known. You will know him yourself. Nehemiah 3 tells the story of how the walls of the city were, were uh, repaired and, and uh, restored. And the gates were put back in place. You know, Jerusalem had been destroyed, as you are well aware, by the Babylonians many years before. And here comes Nehemiah, sent by King Artaxerxes from Persia to this task of restoring Jerusalem. And this chapter, chapter 3, tells us how that great work was accomplished. I think chapter 3, quite frankly, in, in the book of Nehemiah is one of the most significant chapters. Now, Nehemiah 3 is largely made up of names that are difficult to pronounce, and they seem to be about people who have long ago been forgotten. Uh, when you read through the Bible, occasionally you'll come across a passage like this. You know, a passage with lots of names, and you wonder, what is this all about? You might read Nehemiah 3 and say, what do all these names have to do with this task of rebuilding the walls and restoring the gates of this ancient city? 
Well, Nehemiah was a leader who, as the saying goes, planned his work and worked his plan. And the way he did it is an example for us to follow today, thousands of years later. You read through the book of Nehemiah chapter 3, you will find there are 38 specific individuals mentioned by name. 42 different groups of people are identified. And I would surmise that uh, there are also workers who were very busy with what needed to be done whom Nehemiah didn't even name. Their names are not recorded in Nehemiah chapter 3. They're anonymous people. But they were assigned a job and they got to work doing what they were supposed to do. One commentator I read said this, God is a great believer in putting names down. And that's true. And that should encourage us, yeah. I think, because it, it means that God has not forgotten our names either. He loves to record the names of, of those who are unknown or those who maybe are obscure to other people. Now, now the reason the workers finished this task that they were assigned was because they, they obeyed the same leader, Nehemiah. They, 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 they kept their eyes on the same goal, restoring the walls and, and, and the gates, and they worked together for the glory of God. Now, you read through the book of Nehemiah, you discover that there were enemies who did not want this, this city rebuilt. There were enemies outside and there were enemies within. But that did not keep them from fulfilling this God-given task that they were assigned. Now, years later, you might recall when you read the book of Philippians and you go to chapter 3 and you read about Paul's testimony, I think the same attitude that Paul had is the attitude that these people in Nehemiah's day had, and that is, this one thing I do. Now, in today's story, we, we read about common, ordinary people uh, who would find their place um, along a portion of the wall and they would begin to work where they were. If you read through the chapter carefully, you'll discover that to be true. And, and they would know when their work was done, when the rebuilding of the walls and the restoring of the gates was completed. Now, here's the punctuation point, the big idea. I'll try to wrap some thoughts around this idea. I believe, this is me, I believe that when ministering to individuals in the name of the Lord, we need and must keep, seek help from each other as well as from the Lord. We, we cannot do the work that God has called us to do on our own. Remember this, there are many things in life that will catch your eye, but only a few will catch your heart. Pursue those. Amen. That's what you find in Nehemiah chapter 3. The work of building the kingdom where we are will never be accomplished unless we, we, are, we are determined, as the people were in Nehemiah's day, to work toward this common goal of cooperation. Now, just like the workers in Nehemiah's day um, faced a, you know, a, a, a formidable foe, and again, you read through the book and you'll discover that. We too, as we do our work, are going to encounter a, a, an enemy who does not want us to get done what the Lord has called us to do. We all know that. He will do everything he can to keep us from accomplishing the mission that the Lord has clearly given to us. But Jesus told us what our mission is, right? Matthew 28, Acts chapter 1, it's to go into all the world. You know, it's to wait in Jerusalem until the Spirit comes and then be witnesses everywhere. This idea of, of, of the walls and gates needing to be rebuilt and restored is portrayed in a very dramatic way throughout Nehemiah chapter 3. Now, the chapter is, is too long to be read in detail. But if you will follow along with me, I think we'll discover several principles for working together. And I will address each of them very quickly. <clears throat> Before I do, let me share one of Aesop's fables. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Aesop. Um, these little stories that he has are, are just, I think, just have a very wonderful application. Well, there's one Aesop fable that he wrote that talked about how there were four oxen who lived in a field where a lion also lived. 
And a lion, uh, the lion on a number of occasions would, uh, would seek to attack the oxen. But whenever the oxen, whenever he approached, they always put their tails together. So from whichever direction he approached, the, the lion was always met with a set of horns. Well, the fable goes on and says how um, over time, the oxen began to quarrel among themselves and they all decided the best thing to do is for each of us to go to our own corner of the field. And as the fable goes on, it talks about how the lion ended each oxen's life one at a time. And the moral of the story, the moral of the fable is very simple. We really do need each other. We do. We do in the church. Um, you know, when I became a believer, <clears throat> I discovered several things. I discovered several things that I could not say anymore. Uh, one of those was, you do not need me. I could not look around in the, in the body of Christ and say to those around me, I don't, you don't need me. And the reason is because everybody in the body of Christ, everyone needs everyone else. And the second statement I do not need you. I could not look around and say to a body of believers, I don't need you because I, I really do need others. And it is the awareness of that truth that makes the church a living, a warm, a vital, and a loving relationship. I hope what you were exactly finding here at Crossroads. Now this story in Nehemiah 3 dramatically illustrates this fable that I gave to you just a moment ago about the, the lion and the oxen. As we study Nehemiah chapter three, you'll discover several principles that apply to all human behavior, not just work in the church, but especially the work of building the church. So follow along as I share four of these principles with you the value of working together. And hopefully the note sheet that Belinda has placed in the bulletin this morning will be of help to you. Here's principle number one. All the people were involved in the project. Look at Nehemiah 3, 1 and 2, and verse 12. Uh, in, 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 when, when Nehemiah summoned the people together, uh, the people of Jerusalem and then the, those who lived outside Jerusalem in the, the other communities. Um, he gave them a task. And because they were willing to get involved in the project, you will later find in the book of Nehemiah that in 52 days, they rebuilt the wall and they restored all of the gates. That's a very important picture of, of a New Testament principle. And that, that, that simply is the ministry of the church belongs to everyone. No exceptions. Now, years ago, I don't know how prevalent it is today. I'm sure that there are still people who feel this way. But I know years ago, it was a very strong belief that only the pastor and only the hired staff were to do the work of evangelizing and teaching and counseling and visiting and healing hurts and, and meeting people's needs. In fact, there would be those who would not be shy in saying that. Pastor, that's not my job. That's why we pay you. You ought to be doing that. Or that's why we hired so-and-so to take care of our young people or to take care of our older folks or, or to do administrative work. Um, in reality, the, the, the ministry of the church belongs to everyone, everyone in the congregation. Amen. For the work to be completed, Everyone must get involved at some level. Now, not everyone will be involved at the same level. Not everyone will be involved as much as maybe someone else. And that's also demonstrated in Nehemiah chapter 3. For example, look at verses 1 and 2. Eliashib, the high priest, and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far, far as the Tower of the Hundred which they dedicated, and as far as the tower of Hananel. The men of Jericho, an outside city, built the adjoining section. Zakur, son of Imri, built next to them. When you read that, you find that the priests began the work, 
And then alongside them came the Levites. A number of rulers are also mentioned. People were willing to get their hands dirty. In fact, we read about, as you read through chapter 3, you, you read about gatekeepers and guards and farmers and perfume makers and jewelers and pharmacists and merchants and temple servants. All were willing to get involved in the work. Now, I don't know what each one specifically did, but I do know this. Every one of them put their heart and their muscle into doing the job that needed to be done. And for some, probably their hands were, were, were tender and soft because this was not the kind of work that they normally did. But nevertheless, they worked. Even women were directly involved. Look at verse 12. Shalem, son of Halahash, ruler of half district of, of Jerusalem, repaired the next section with the help of his daughters. And so in this verse, you find that, that, that women worked right alongside the men. And all of them, by the way, men, women, were volunteers. Nobody was drafted. Nobody was constricted. No, no one was forced to do the rebuilding work. No one was paid for their work. This was literally a labor of love. Just like the church today, oftentimes. You know, some lived in Jerusalem and others lived in the surrounding towns of Jericho and Tekoa and Mizpah and, and the other outlying villages of Judea. And so it is true in the body of Christ. We all have to be engaged in ministry. I don't know of any more important truth for the accomplishing of God's work than that. The only way for the work to get done is when you and I are willing to roll up our sleeves and get to work. <coughs> Literally, what we do is a labor of love. So principle number one, all the people were involved. Here's principle number two. They worked together. Look at verse five and verse 13. In fact, if you read all the way through uh, the, the, the third chapter, it'd be interesting for you to make note of every time you see the phrase next to him or next to them, it occurs over and over and over again. But, but note that the record indicates that not only the workers were listed, but also the shirkers, those who refused to work. That's what it says. Look at verse 5. The, the men, the leaders of Tekoa, the leaders of this town, their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. Can you imagine that? All the work that needed to be done, and some of the people were saying, I am not going to do it. I'm going to stay idle. So this verse, verse 5, indicates that God, God also records goof-offs. You know, those who just refuse to work. And when someone will not take up their ministry, God puts their name down as well. Make note of that, folks. It's important. And I hope that's not the case of anyone here at Crossroads. Now, I really do. I hope that, that each of you are, are like the many of Nehemiah 3 who choose to work. Do, doing different ministries within the church, but everyone finding a spot where they fit. You see, they help one another. G Governor Nehemiah not only had a, a great passion, go back to chapter 1, you'll discover that, but he had the ability to motivate and organize and administrate the work. And some of the workers, it says here, even exceeded what they were asked to do. They did more than they had to. Look at verse 13. The valley gate was, was repaired by Hanan in the residence of Zanoah. They also repaired 500 yards of the wall as far as the Dun Gate. See, they, they exceeded their assignment. And then they went on to help others repairing 1,500 more feet of the wall. And in fact, you will, you will find as you read through the scripture, through this, this chapter, uh, you'll read about others who repaired another section. See, principle number one for working together, all the people were involved. And number two, they worked together. Here's number three, a third principle that I find. They worked near their home. 
Look at verse 10, look at verse 23, look at verse 30. Uh, verse 10, uh, Jediah made repairs opposite his house. Verse 23 tells of a, a, a of certain men who made repairs in front of their house. And Azariah, who made repairs beside his house. And verse 30 talks about a man named uh, Meshulam, the, the son of Berechiah, who made repairs opposite his living quarters. Now, I don't know this, but I'm guessing this man was probably a bachelor, a single man. But he had, and he had an apartment. Uh, no family, but nevertheless, he, he worked right there where he was. You see, the important truth that emerges is that God, this is God's design for ministry. This is his plan for ministry. God has placed all of us strategically where he wants us to be. Don't forget that. He's placed you in your neighborhood, in your office, in your school, in your factory, in your farm, in your home. And that's where your ministry should be. And that's why God put you there. It's not by accident that you live and you work and you socialize in certain places. In, in, the, book, in the New Testament, you go to the, book, the Gospel of John, chapter 15. And then you'll, you'll read about how regarding Jesus' disciples, it says that he appointed, he appointed them. That word appointed in the Greek means he strategically placed them. In other words, he put them in the exact spot where he wanted them to be. Why? Why did he do that? So they could serve him where they were. And I think this is brought out beautifully in, in Nehemiah chapter 3. As we read about the workers laboring in their own neighborhood. See, there are people everywhere, everywhere, who do not know Jesus as their personal Savior. And, and the Lord's given us the opportunity to extend love and grace to them. See, in St. Joseph County, there are many, many men, women, teens, children who have no church connection. You know some of those people. They may live next to you. You may work with them. Where you do your shopping, maybe they're the person that checks you out every week. And if we are, to, are, are ever going to impact people that we may or may not know, who don't have any kind of church connection, it'll be because we are willing to practice this elementary principle. We do ministry where we live, where we work, where we socialize. God's given us that opportunity. See, the people in Nehemiah's day, they didn't have to go to the other side of the city to work. They were able to work right where they lived, right in the area where they, where they, they would move and be with other people. So I think principle number one for working together all the people were involved. Principle number two, they worked together. Principle number three, they worked near their home. And here's the last principle. Each one completed the assigned task. In fact, look at all of Nehemiah chapter three. I'm not gonna specifically highlight one particular verse. See, the, the, the people just kept on working until they had finished the job. Now, some had more to do than others. Some chose to do more than they were required, but no one failed, except the nobles of Tekoa who refused to work. And I've learned through the years that responsibility is one of the marks of spiritual maturity. See, I've been around a while, and I've pastored churches, and I served as a superintendent for a number of years, and, and, and what I have noticed is that the most mature congregants within a church are those who stay with the work that has been assigned to them until it is done. They don't walk away because they're tired or because they're bored. They keep at it and do what it is that God has placed upon their heart to do. It's as simple as that. Anyone can start a project. We all know that. And plenty of people have. You know, they start something and they move on to something else. Um, anyone can start a project, but the mature are the ones who follow through until the job is finally done. That's what you find in this story as you read through Nehemiah chapter 3. So principle number one, 
All the people were involved. Number two, they worked together. Number three, they worked near their home. And number four, they completed their assigned task. Now, just like each of these four principles um, directed Nehemiah in what was going on, um, so it is today in the church. For individuals to become you know, fully devoted followers of Jesus, these principles have got to be followed as well. Now, I, I truly believe that, that if we will use these four principles to guide us, we will definitely see lost people come to Christ. We'll see the kingdom of God grow and expand. And we too, like the people of Nehemiah's day, as it says here, that the, the walls were rebuilt, the gates were restored, and the people gave praise to God. We will do the exact same thing. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to invest my life doing that, doing what Jesus has called me to do, what is most important. You know, I don't know how much time I have left, but, but I want to make the days count, the weeks count, the months count, the years count. How about you? Here, here's the takeaway. I want you to think about this. You know, the, the, the takeaway answers the question, how should I respond? When I look at Nehemiah chapter 3, Nehemiah 3 simply lays before us a potential plan to help us accomplish the task Jesus has given us, you know, rebuilding the walls and restoring the gates, a.k.a. also known as impacting lives for Jesus. And I believe if we, if we are willing to employ these four principles, Crossroads Missionary Church will be further down the road a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, in fulfilling your mission statement doing what you believe God has called you as a congregation to do. See, with the Lord's help, you know, we can make a difference where we are. You right here in, in, you know, in St. Joseph County and, and in the villages and towns and cities of you know, Menden and Centerville and, and Three Rivers and Schoolcraft and Vicksburg and White Pigeon, et cetera, et cetera. Colon and Leonidas, it starts with leadership. Setting the direction, just like Nehemiah chapter 3. The, the, the work in Nehemiah 3 would never have been accomplished if someone wasn't holding the reins, if someone wasn't giving out, in a sense, the, the orders and saying, this is what needs to be done. Nehemiah did that. <clears throat> it's a congregation. You have those leaders in your church who do that very thing. Your pastor does that. Um, Matt, as your board chairman, does that. Jordan, as your, as your deacon board chairman, does that. That's how the work gets done. We, the leaders take the lead, as they should, and I am convinced of this, that the rank and file will follow. In all of my years of ministry, I have found that when the leader really does, is passionate and, and wants to accomplish something and believes it's what God wants, there are those in the church who will follow along because they want to see God work too. But for the Lord to do what he did through Nehemiah chapter 3, we have to go back to chapter 1 that I know you've already covered in previous messages. But this opening chapter tells how Nehemiah responded when he heard the news regarding the desolation of Jerusalem. It says there, verse 4, Nehemiah 1, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned, I fasted, and I prayed before the God of heaven. You want to talk about a recipe for God to respond to whatever it is that's on your heart. That's it. God will respond when, when we have that kind of an attitude. So before we can find the results of Nehemiah 3, there must be the brokenness of Nehemiah chapter 1. And Nehemiah clearly has a, a deep sense of personal concern. Here was a man who was willing to face the facts and to weep over those facts and to tell the Lord all about it. And that's always the place to begin. The Bible clearly says God always welcomes brokenness and contriteness. When we're willing to come before him with that kind of attitude, he'll respond. Now, going back to Nehemiah 3, there was no one single person including Nehemiah, 
who could have accomplished the work of, of repairing the walls and restoring the gates. Um, it took the passion of a, of, a, of, a, of a Nehemiah, the leadership skills of a Nehemiah, and the cooperation of the people. Each one had a job to do. And so it is at Crossroads. What, you know, what we cannot do alone, we can do together. And that's clearly found here in, in Nehemiah chapter 3. Let me close with this. It's a story I read some years ago from, uh, from Chuck Swindoll. Many of you have heard him, of course, on the radio. Um, he, he speaks about Moses, uh, going back to uh, his experience in the, in, the, in the desert, in the wilderness, when God showed up in a burning bush. He, this is what he says. What was God's larger message to Moses in that moment? Release your imagination for a few moments. It might have included some thoughts such as these. Moses, 40 years ago, you were a fine-looking bush, <clears throat> Impressed with all your foliage. You had long, strong branches and lush green leaves. But when your bush started burning, it was gone in less than 48 hours. Your grand scheme went up in flames, charring your dreams and consuming your ambitions along with it. There was nothing left, was there? That was your life, Moses. And then you ran like a scared rabbit across the border to get away from the Egyptian lynch mob. You thought you were a choice, top quality bush before that happened. And now you don't think you're worth much at all. Listen, man, any bush will do as long as I, the great God of all grace, am in the bush. I want to use you, Moses. Stand still and let me set you on fire. And then Swindoll goes on and says, what does it take to qualify as a bush that God will use? Well, you have to be dried up and thorny. You have to be dusty and dirty. You've got to be ordinary. What else? You have to be burnable. God is looking for flammable bushes. There are some good looking bushes and shrubs out there in Christendom that don't burn at all. They're made out of asbestos. You couldn't set them on fire with a welding torch. Napon even would not do the job. These are beautiful replicas of beautiful plants, but they won't burn. This means they are of no use to God. Then he closes this way. He says, the truth is, any old bush will do as long as God is in the bush. That's what he was saying to Moses. I believe that's what he was saying to Nehemiah. I want you to burn for me as no man has burned before. You've been dried out and well seasoned in this howling wasteland for these years. I wanted to draw you out, and I pruned away all those things that you used to hang on to, that meant so much to you. I have induced you to a simple love for me. That's all you have to offer, Moses, and that's all I want. Let's begin there. Let's begin where Moses and Nehemiah began. You know, believing the Lord wants to do something special through us. You know, for his glory, for his honor. How God wants to do something special through this church, through Pastor Alex, through the leadership team, and through each one of you as you seek to fulfill what you believe God has called your church to do. I think the story in Nehemiah 3 helps us to see how that can become reality. I want to pause as we bring, bring this all to a close and, and just pause for a, a few just for a, a, a short time and, and allow you to pray right where you are. You can come to the altar if you choose to, that's fine. But if God has spoken to your heart about, your, about you getting off the sidelines and into the, into the, onto the team, onto the field, mm, then tell him about it. To tell him that you want to be a bush that burns brightly. And I guarantee you that if, if, you are contrite and humble, God will hear you, and he will use you for his glory, for your good, and for the good of those around you. So let us pray.
Dear Lord, take this, uh, this simple message from this powerful chapter and, and, and Lord, blaze it on our hearts and help us, God, as we leave today, that we'll leave different than when we came in. More determined, Lord, by your grace to do what it is that you've called us to do. Guide, direct, lead us, Lord, today, tomorrow, all the days of this next week and all the days of our life. Use us, God, in a great way, and we'll give you glory and praise and honor. Amen. Amen. Well, please uh, shake hands with those around you, and you are dismissed.